CataractCoach.com. High myoprefractive targeting. This is why I do not aim for Plano in these cases. Now, of course, you know Plano is our word for zero, 0. 0.00. So you would think that for a lot of eyes, hitting that zero refractive target would be ideal. And it is. That's the sharpest possible distance vision, which is great for all kinds of patients and all kinds of lenses, but not for the ultra-high myope. And why is that? you got to remember that the thing you do not want to do is have this myopic patient end up hyperopic. This patient's a minus 10 or 12 or minus 15 of myopia. And if the patient ends up plus a half or plus one as a post-op target, that post-op refraction of slight hyperopia is going to give this patient a headache. They're going to say it just feels too strong. They're feeling it's going to feel like overcorrected glasses. Now, as opposed to if you leave this patient, let's say, minus a half or minus one, it's super comfortable for the patient. It's like when the patient wears his or her older glasses that undercorrect the eyes by about a diopter. They don't, they don't see razor sharp with those old glasses, but those old glasses are really comfortable. And arguably, with a monofocal lens, to be a little bit myopic and emphasize a little bit more of that intermediate range or that computer range is probably a good thing. So in this case, we're going to take this patient from a pre-op refractive error of somewhere around minus 15 and give the patient a post-op refractive error about minus 1.5. So that means we're correcting 90% of the myopia. The toric lens is going to correct 100% of the astigmatism. And this patient is going to be absolutely thrilled. Now look at the video right there. Where's the iris? Why has the iris disappeared? Because that's reverse pupillary block, right? Commonly seen in these ultra-myopic eyes with a very long axial length, you get that reverse pupillary block. Now, I'm using it a little bit to my advantage to just get that nucleus out of the eye. Not a very dense nucleus in this case. So being very cautious, look at the position of the chopper. The smooth end is down, the safety position of the chopper. Because I don't want that capsule to come forward. If you break a capsule in an eye that is ultramyopic and you get vitreous prolapse, the risk of now having a retinal detachment or retinal complication is much higher, many times higher. So at all costs, try to avoid that. So at this point, we'll clean up the cortex. Now you see the iris came back into view. When you put the infusion in, you can again get that reverse pupillary block. And that can help you to a degree to get full exposure of the caps or bag, but you may also need to tent up that iris to break the reverse pupillary block or alternatively push down on the anterior lens capsule in order to return the eye to a more normal configuration and to keep the patient comfortable. Now, cleaning up the capsule back here is certainly important, but I'd encourage you not to go overboard on the capsule polishing. Again, these ultramyopic guys can have a weaker or more fragile capsule, and the last thing you want to do is have an issue with a broken capsule. So again, I encourage you, for refractive targeting of these patients, encourage them to embrace a little bit of post-op myopia. Another thing that's been discussed here is that the refractive calculations, your eye will power estimation, is going to be less accurate in these unusual eyes. Average eyes are much easier to calculate. Unusual eyes are more challenging to calculate. So when you aim for a minus 1.5, such as in this case, the patient could end up very easily minus 1 or minus 2. That's plus or minus a half doctor, but they could even have more variation. And it's not so much because of the effective lens position, because remember, the lower the lens power, the less the effective lens position has on the lens calculation, on the refractive outcome, right? Think of a patient who gets who's so myopic you put in a zero power eye well. Does it even matter where in the eye the eye well sits? It's not going to change the refractive outcome at all, whether that lens is in the bag, the sulcus, anywhere you want. The ELP has almost no role as the Iowa power is very close to zero, very low. So in this case, it's more so getting accurate biometry ahead of time and then limitations of some of our calculations or methods of doing those calculations. So here at the end of the case, we've got a toric lens in good position. And you can see there's a good overlap of that optic by the caps rexus. And so again, for this patient, we're able to fix the pre-existing corneal astigmatism. We'll correct 90% of the pre-existing myopia. 
and it will aim for a post-op refractive outcome about minus 1.5. So again, correcting 90% of the patient's myopia at the time of surgery. Now the beauty here is the patient ended up just about what we predicted, about minus 1.25. And she found that I was good enough for her to do most of her normal activities, including computer work, stuff around the house, her favorite hobbies of cooking and baking, all that without glasses. And she certainly just wears glasses to drive, especially at nighttime. But even in the daytime, if the sun is shining, going outside with a refractive air of minus 1.25 in the bright California sun means that you actually see pretty well without any glasses. So certainly it was the right choice of this patient, and she was very happy with the outcome here. I encourage you, if you're doing cataract surgery on someone who's ultra-myopic, this patient got a six-diopter lens. Keep that in mind. If you're this myopic, really don't aim for plano. We don't have the accuracy to predict that with our power estimations and calculations, and these patients actually appreciate a little myopia.